Cleveland Film Talk takes you behind the camera lens and introduces filmmakers from the 37th Cleveland International Film Festival. Documentary films have the power of putting us inside of the intimate struggles and joys of family. Our two filmmakers today do just that. Our first guest, Dauphine Lanson, your film Father's Birth follows a couple on their journey to become a father. Can you please tell us how their story came to you? Yes, well, um, they were friends of friends in Paris, acquaintances, not really friends yet. Um, and gay parenting in France is quite rare in general, uh, not very well known, but their story was somewhat very amazing uh, to have the possibility to have children through a surrogate mother. I knew nothing of that and I had become a mother myself uh, quite uh, recently because I had uh, my child was one year old at the time. I was very moved by motherhood and thousands of questions were just raising into my mind and uh, the clarity of the process that these two men were going through, the, the uh, strength of their desire to become fathers moved me to, into making the movie. I think that's wonderful. One thing that American audiences I think need to understand is that surrogacy is illegal in France. How did that shape your documentary? Well, <clears throat> To, to start with, uh, when I started to make the movie, uh, I knew the whole thing was illegal, but there wasn't such a big debate about it in France. Um, it was just illegal. But then, uh, when the film was released uh, only a few months ago, um, it, it happened during a huge debate and demonstrations in France around the subject. So more than shaping the actual documentary, it shaped the release and the way it was received in France by the audience uh, because it became part of the debate and people saw it in the assembly and uh, there was a huge uh, turmoil about, about it because nobody had actually seen surrogacy through the prism of a personal human love story. Mm -hmm. And your film does a really wonderful job of putting us right into um, this family. Was that your intention when you started out, that you really wanted to make this a piece about family and even though that's what they're trying to be and become? Yes, uh, my intention was to have to draw intimate portraits of these two men becoming fathers, the journey to fatherhood in very exceptional circumstances and uh, and also to to look at the bond the very subtle bond that was going to um, take place in between the surrogate mother them the husband of the surrogate mother her children it's two families in a way one to become and one that already existed and the one that already exists is going to help the one to become so you really uh, capture some intimate scenes. How do you strike the balance between being present and being there, but not wanting your camera to, you know, be obtrusive? That was a very, very strong, important point for me. I never wanted to be intrusive. I never wanted to be voyeuristic. And that's, I think, one of the reasons why they accepted the documentaries. I told them straight away that if they felt uncomfortable at any time, I would just stop. So, I don't know how you strike the balance. <laughs> it was just intuitive. Mm -hmm. I tried to be there all the time, but not be too too present. And I think they, they forgot me after a while. <laughs> Sometimes they would even forget that I had to eat because they didn't really know I was that. <laughs> That's when you, success, when you yeah, really hit yeah. that moment with them or connection yeah. with them. Um, you, you have such a daft hand in, as a filmmaker in, in Father's Birth. This is not your first film. Where, um, what are some of the other learning processes or learning, you know, films that you did earlier that helped you learn how to become such a strong filmmaker? Thank you very much for a start. Uh, <clears throat> well, I did a few short films. Um, uh, I worked a lot with circus artists, so on how to film movement and how to film in movement. Uh, That's unusual. Yeah. Mm. It's fantastic. Uh, 
And I worked, um, it, it is the first time this time that I was holding the camera myself. Mm -hmm. I was generally directing, but I had a DOP. This time for very obvious reasons of intimacy, I could not be with anyone else. So I had to learn as I went, as I was filming, mm -hmm. uh, how to handle the camera, the light, uh, the sound, how to be there but not too present. I mean, that, that was a, a huge learning process in the making of the film. Uh, but it's true that before that I had had my eye was trained because I knew what I liked and what I wanted. And I worked with um, uh, cameramen who would be acrobats themselves and who would do uh, moving shots, which was quite exciting. And so I work on, on that right. too. Right. Yeah. I, I like your choice and I understand it that this time you took the camera up in your own hands mm. as opposed to the process of working with the DOP. Um, how much time in, ha in having that camera and being with uh, the two men, were you with them, you know, when you would follow them? How long at one particular, you know, shooting session or how many years did you guys cover? Well, <clears throat> I covered nine months, the time of the pregnancy, right. uh, really. <laughs> Uh, and uh, some of it is in America with the surrogate mother mm -hmm. and them when they visited her and some of it is in France with them waiting to go to America and becoming parents from a distance uh, with the Skypes with her so yeah the, the, the period that was covered was was uh, roughly nine months uh, but the the most intense periods of shooting mm -hmm were during the last month before the arrival of the children, the birth of the children, right. and just after the birth of the children, when we were in the States and we were together all the time right. for nearly a month. <laughs> Considering that it was a different uh, shooting style than you had worked with before, being a director who had a full crew and now being, um, you know, a, a sort of backpack journalist in, in some ways, what was one of the most unexpected lessons uh, that you learned on father's birth in shooting it? Oh, one of the uh, really unexpected lessons was that you have to back everything up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> because you never yes. know. Yeah, you really have to be very, very cautious with your material and and back up and transfer the data, check that you have the data. I mean, it sounds silly, but it really is vital oh. because specifically when you're by yourself, you really need to double check that you're not losing anything, mm -hmm. any images. And oh, I uh, totally. It's one of those things that'll wake you up at 2 a.m. Mm. in the morning. Did mm. I back up? Because yeah. you may have had a great day and mm. captured things mm. that you can't recreate. No, you can't recreate. You have to be there all the time. You have to be very, eyes very open. Excellent. Very mm. good. Um, we have a media arts program here uh, at Tri C, and I'd like for you to share with our students what's some advice that you would give them as they begin learning how to create films? Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> Take a camera. Pick a subject, follow your heart, make mistakes. Uh, don't be afraid of mistakes. Make loads of mistakes. That's the only thing that will teach you anything. Mm. And, 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 and do things. Uh, go to dance classes, uh, fall in love, <laughs> live, um, <laughs> and make, make films. I like that. Yes, I, I definitely like the aspect of, of living and doing. Mm. I think filmmakers, we get to where all we do is watch movies. Mm. All we do. Mm. So that's really fantastic. In, in the in the topic of living, I, I'd like to ask you kind of a fun question. Yeah, sure. Um, if you were to shoot the biopic of your life, oh God, <laughs> who would you cast to play you? Oh my God, I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> um, as a younger version of me or me now? <laughs> you, you, either one, either one, your choice. <laughs> Yeah, I hadn't thought of that at all. Um, as a younger version of me, I think I'd have liked some, someone like maybe Kirsten Dunst. Um, and as me now, uh, or maybe a bit later, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like the, your choice for there. Um, yeah. I'm going to ask you another. This is sort of like just a period of getting to know you as yeah. a person with a series of fun questions. Um, what was the last movie you downloaded from iTunes? <laughs> Actually, um, I can't remember the last movie I downloaded from iTunes because I was in Hong Kong and I couldn't do that for the film. I was in Hong Kong for the film. Yes. But I watched movies on the plane. And uh, the last movie I watched was The Runaway Bride, <laughs> <laughs> which was like a really old right. mo movie with Richard Gere. Right. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, it was nice. It was, it was fun, fun romance. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One last of our just sort of getting to know you. Um, what was your favorite movie when you were 12 years old? 
I'd have to say it was Grease. Oh, yeah. I can relate to that. I love that film. Yes, yeah. Did you sing along with I it? I sang along. <laughs> I watched it really a lot. <laughs> right. Delphine, I, I really appreciate your coming with us. I, I am curious and would like to know, are you still in touch with the fathers? Um, and and as, their, you know, as their family is growing and changing, do you guys uh, stay in touch? Yes, yes, we do. Uh, they're very busy with the kids, <laughs> so obviously. Uh, and I have a child myself, so, and we have busy lives, but we do keep in touch quite regularly. And the really nice, nice thing right now is yeah. that we are all going to the Madison Film Festival in two days' time. Oh, and, excellent. Yeah, and uh, the surrogate mother, Colleen, will be there. Wonderful. And they will be there, and the kids will be there. Everyone will be meet around the film in Madison in oh, two days. Wonderful. And is that one of the first um, times that they are going to be able to talk about the film and their experience? Well, talk about, no, I think they've, they've exchanged a lot of emails and mm -hmm. Skype since, since the birth of the children, okay. but it's the first time that they will meet again after the birth of the children. Mm. Oh, fantastic. Mm. That's mm. wonderful. Yeah. What other projects do you have coming up? Well, I'm now in the process of writing a feature film, uh, fiction, and uh, that's actually the first project that was that I was working on with circus artists just before I started oh, this documentary. Right, which is such an interesting topic. Mm. Yes. And it's uh, about a man becoming blind and he's in full denial of what's happening to him. And so he's going to dive, uh, not really knowing why, accidentally within himself. And within himself, there's a house, a metaphor of his own body, in which live, uh, in the middle of the forest, in which live acrobats, dancers. And, oh, wow. We yeah. will have to keep our eyes out for this film and uh, look forward to seeing it. Thank you so much, Delphine, for joining us. Well, I thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you for joining us. We will be back. I chose the media arts program at Tri-C because I fell in love with the camera. I've always wanted to be a filmmaker uh, and I just never thought it was possible. One of the things that makes the media arts and studies program different from some other programs is we really marry a study of the art of story and story structure with hands-on real-world production experience. Just for an example, our students in their first year will get introduced to the equivalent of a one-ton grip truck worth of media equipment and at the same time, they're breaking down scripts, they're breaking down treatments, and they're learning about how the structure of the story is gonna influence every other thing they do in post and all the way through distribution and marketing. I was surprised by the quality of the equipment that the school provides because it is professional equipment, stuff that you will see in the industry. I was definitely surprised and overwhelmed with all this uh, equipment that they have to offer. It's very exciting to be able to have that hands-on opportunity and to learn all the ins and outs of this stuff. The faculty who teach in the Media Arts and Studies program come from a range of disciplines. So we have working cinematographers and we have editors and we have motion graphic artists and of course they're all educators as well. They are working in the field that we are all trying to get into so they are very informative to tell you how things really are so you don't show up to a job and are completely shocked. The collaborative opportunities that are available to Media Arts and Studies students are limited only by their own pre-production, really. We have had students collaborate with dance, with theater, with um, recording arts and technology, and even automotive technology and uh, fire training academy. I've collaborated with some of the photo students. They can take stills and stuff and they have cameras too. So. There's a lot of opportunity to collaborate and learn more. Another exterior shot. The faculty is extremely supportive uh, with our creativity, with our projects. I've yet to be limited on what I can bring to the table as far as story. I'm able to be that artist. You know, I'm able to be the one in charge of that visual design that I want to get across, and I have a lot of fun doing that. You don't really have to go to New York or L.A. to live your dream. I mean, it's right in Cleveland.
Our second filmmaker, Carlo Guillermo Proto, courageously shares his father's story to self-euthanize in the film El Waso. Carlo, what were your concerns as you began to share such an intimate story on film? Um, I think it was more the, the participation of, my father was willing to very much so uh, do the film. He, his uh, main motivation um, behind the film was uh, to sort of to create an advocacy film for euthanasia in, in Canada. And then as soon as he realized that I wasn't interested in making that story at all, um, he, show, he wanted to make the film as a, um, answering the question of why he would do something like that for my niece and nephew um, when they grew up. Um, but ultimately, he was very willing to participate. It was more my, my sisters and my mom. That was like my how, that was always a big struggle to try to keep them participating as, as, a, as subjects, I guess. Uh, you talk about how you, just now you said how you had a different direction for it than he did. Uh -huh. What were some of those conversations? Were they difficult to have to, ex N to no, express not, with not him? No, not at all because, uh, I mean, it's a documentary film and so there was like, the film stylistically is, is very much, um, it has this fiction feel to it. So it's not a, ver it's not a linear documentary. There's no m uh, me talking behind the camera or anything or, you know, using any sort of like walls in that way. Like if you were to see the film today, um, you would think that I was just um, a participant, a subject in the film. You can't really identify me as, as the director because I'm, I'm putting myself in the same position that I did like with my family. In that style, there um, begins to bring up the questions of uh, a film, uh, a camera being present mm -hmm. while there's something very intense and um, difficult that's happening in front of it. Right. And I think the audience begins to wonder, when does this person who's behind that camera intercede, stop? It becomes begged of your role a little more because yeah. they feel that you have the power yeah. to intercede and stop. Yeah, it's, it's a good thing that you touched on um, because for the first time, like my father wasn't any different than any other subject where you really have to um, have that sort of like buffer period where they're very much acting in front of the camera. And I had to have conversations with my father to just be like, you know, you're allowed to get angry, like you're allowed to show emotion, you're allowed to because my father, um, you know, because of his past, he just needs things to be in a very sort of controlled way. And we, we did get to a point where it was, it was as authentic as we could get it with having this third person, this camera, like in the room. Um, so, I mean, this whole idea of like verite and, 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 and capturing truth and what truth is, I mean, there, you know, I've been, um, I've been criticized a lot with this film by um, real uh, film, with documentary filmmakers who are real purists. Mm -hmm. And um, they, f they find that like, because of my style, it looks sort of like bent or manipulative and po possibly even scripted, but it wasn't. There was nothing in the film that was, scripted. It's just that the, the, the approach of like how I actually told the film is, is, a, is a bit different. So this is like my version of the truth. This is like the, this is my truth. And I think in documentary in general, there is no real truth. There's just a, it's just a, an interpretation or a version of a truth. There's truth is, I mean, that's something that you learn a lot in sort of the academic world, like neorealism and, um, and, and what that means and, and actual realism. And, and I just find that to just be, um, it's just nonsense because to actually try to capture truth, it's only a version of the director's truth. I, I think that your cinema verite approach um, feels appropriate in understanding that your goal wasn't to talk about the medical history mm -hmm. of uh, euthanasia. It wasn't to talk about the political mm -hmm. process of it. You really wanted us to put. A, you really want to put the audience inside of your family, dealing with this. Yeah. Well, stylistically, um, and also just. Um, as a, as a filmmaker, I'm not interested in, in, at least right now at this stage, I'm not interested in telling macro stories. I'm interested in, in telling micro stories to, to try to explain a larger truth or a, more of a macro reality that we sort of like live in. Um, so personal stories and very specific stories um, that are about relationships and are about, like, hu the, about the human condition. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very much into, into that style right now in, in, in the stories that I want to tell. But, I mean, at the same time, of oh, you know, I definitely have like aspirations or, or um, ideas to make larger documentaries about like you know about the economy, for example. Like people very much don't understand how the economy works. It's sort of this almost like this uh, 
this fable or like this otherness of of how things work, and people really have no clue. So that those are those are that it, it depends on the information in the story that I want to tell. Like it's so the style for me. Um, always gets chosen by the story right. I actually want to tell, as opposed to imposing a style onto a story. Right. Having that understanding of craft and an understanding that there are different styles that you can select and really mm -hmm. wanting to marry them with the content, mm -hmm. um, is that something that you learned as a filmmaker, as you created movies, or did you have, um, did you study film in school? What was your education process? Yeah, I, um, I was really into, I was very much into, into um, into theater for a very long time. Uh, I was in theater, I worked in theater in various capacities as an actor, director, general manager, producer, company producer. I was lucky enough to work with one of my childhood heroes who's who actually is a story editor to El Huaso, um, Guillermo Verdecchia, and um, he wrote a play that, that basically changed my life and, it talked, and it's called Fronteras Americanas and uh, it's about uh, being first generation Canadian or North American really and what does that actually mean. The idea of like, you know, like I'm, my parents are from Chile, so when I'm in Chile, I want to be uh, in Canada. When I'm in Canada, I want to be in Chile. So there's, and so where's your home? Right. And you find it at the border, in La, in la Frontera, like at the border. And that's the yes. sort of thesis of that. So that was a very big um, foundation, almost seed to me actually creating any form of art. It was like a big inspiration. And uh, so, but with theater, I always like hit this perpetual like uh, creative wall where I wasn't really um, fully executing the stories and the, and, the, and the the stories and the art that I wanted to create. Um, mostly because I was just, because uh, I was diagnosed dyslexic when I was like in grade five. Okay. So that, that whole idea of script saw. and the way yeah. that it's, and the limitations of it and the black box. And I love the, the directness. I love like the immediate uh, intimacy of it, but. Um, but it sounds like you wanted to even get more I intimate, which a camera can exactly, do. It, Exactly, and I wanted to go in there, and uh, and I made a, a, a short film called Pura Sangre, which played a few festivals, but I wasn't very ambitious with it. It didn't push it a lot, and it, um, and, it, and it was successful, and it was and it, it organically. Um, uh, it felt very, um, it was a very organic process. Like it felt very natural, and I, it didn't feel forced. And so, right after that, in 2005, I applied to the only film school I wanted to go to in Canada, which is the Mel Hopenheim School of Cinema. Um, uh, and my first, uh, my first year prof was this documentary filmmaker named Dan Cross um, who made a film called The Streets and um, The Street sorry and um, it, it was he was it was a really big inspiration um, on this idea of, of trying to be as authentic as you possibly can mm -hmm. through your own voice and that was like a really big lesson I mean I, my films aren't stylistically the same way that he really gets in there um, you know he was doing he was doing like a these sort of Michael Moore style sort of documentaries, but there wasn't humor in it. It was just him being a sound person and, and, and almost as this sort of intervention or almost as form as like as a intervention or a art therapy in a sort mm -hmm. of like way, mm -hmm. which was really controversial at the time. And, and my school that I came from like Concordia is, is there were known for documentary um, animation and, um, and uh, experimental film. So that's how- Very we're, expressive. Yeah, and we're very, we were very much like at that school about the why and, and the intent and um, uh, why we're doing certain approaches, but also questioning the medium. And so that's why with me, El Huaso was like really, it was, a very, it was a very natural way of doing it, but I didn't want to be, I didn't want to have that power that you can have behind the camera. I didn't want to be talking at my dad. I wanted to be there participating in the moment. And even that took a lot of time. Like the crew, I initially had like this one crew um, that one of the producers told me that I should have um, and didn't work out at all. And, um, and then I ended up going and working with the people that I studied with. There's just like my close friends. And that's, you know, that's a big recommendation to like young filmmakers. Do work with who you're comfortable with, not who you think you should be working with. Oh, excellent, yeah, and um, even in more of what else did you learn when you were making El Lasso that um, you maybe didn't know before when you were in school? So much. I mean, I think a big influence too is not, like, n not necessarily on how he makes his films, but it's more his ethic or his approach is like his Herzog. Um, like Werner Herzog, yes. um, but but my films don't really like. He's usually behind the camera. He has like a voiceover. It's his. Um, that's sort of like his style. But it's more the that sort of, you know, for the lack of a better phrase, but like a guerrilla style filmmaking, where you know we shot three scenes, um, one on an airplane, two airports, one is in Toronto, one in in Chile, and it was just like shotgun mic on top of the camera, go in there and wait till they ask you to leave, 
And um, because you A, don't have the money and B, you don't have the manpower to try to get that. And the best thing about looking relatively young is you can just play stupid. <laughs> you can just be like, oh, right. oh, I had, oh really? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm just a film. I'm just a, I'm a student or right. whatever. And then, and then once you get Which older, diffuses situations. Yeah. And yeah. then once you get older, um, you know, you just do Herzog thing and you fake permits yeah. and you learn how to forge, like forge <laughs> permits. Um, it's not obviously, I, you know, ethically, I guess, or I don't even right. know what it is, but there's just so much loopholes and, and like there's, uh, there's like, well, there's a resourcefulness that I think you have to have as a filmmaker. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of those things. As you transition from what sounds like a very um, intense education and really developing yourself, your voice and into, you know, working in the film industry. What were some of the surprises, the struggles in that transition? Well, I mean, I really started off like looking for financing for this film like with a bang. And the level of insensitivity that there is out there for these personal films, like I had producers, I won't say who, which I really, really want to, but it's a very well-known American institution. When, we were, when I was like pitching this and they were really interested in the idea, they were just like, so are you gonna film if it happens like your dad's suicide? Mm -hmm. I mean, even talking about it, it makes me like angry and cry. Like, mm -hmm. I, just, I, I was just like, how, like the level of ins insensitivity, like why, why, like it, things are just so, um, they're so uh, inflated and gross in terms of like, you know, the shock value mm -hmm. or the shock factor that mm -hmm. there is in like North American um, media or in, in, in storytelling. And I just Do find, you find there's a difference in Canadian versus uh, the U.S. approach to that. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, the, 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 it's only because the U.S. has a larger demographic, and it's 350 million people versus 30 million, mm -hmm. and there's just more money to be made. And um, there, you need that. Like, there's, there, you know, the 24-hour news network, like all that. And they, just, they just need content. They need people to be coming back. It's so highly competitive, like here. So, I mean, I feel like people feel like they're sort of like pushed in that direction. But what's really interesting, I mean, there's always these other sides to it, but the resurgence or like the, the, the renaissance of like documentary filmmaking has to do with like that kind of like aggressive approach. Yes. There's, the, there's a, like what I love about being in America, I mean, it obviously it has its sort of disadvantages, but it's that audacity, that sort of like, you know, so much work is being created, but I mean, I was once a programmer for a, a film festival and they were, and the films that I got from the US, some of them were good, but some of them, like, um, it was like a romantic comedy, but like a leprechaun. And so right. And, and they would have like, you know, like the names of the actors, like at the top that nobody knew about. And you're just like, that's it's like, a, it's so unusual. audacious. Right. Yeah, it's, it's so, it's like, they, and there's yeah. like the credits are really long and you're just like, wow, like all these people invested this time in the thing. That's like the other side of that coin. Right. But then at the same time, it produces all of these incredible documentaries that you wouldn't have seen if, if it wasn't for that approach. Well, I'm, I'm certainly glad that you're on the landscape of documentaries and bringing this um, story to us and sharing it with the world. I, it takes a lot of courage. And I appreciate you coming and sitting with us and talking and sharing that experience and process. Thank you very much, Carla. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for joining us.